Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion and Bethany Lutheran Churches, and this is Pastor Christopher Johnson, also serving here with me at these churches. And we are here to have your word at the middle of the week as we continue our way through Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6. We are looking at the Sermon on the Mount and the question, what sort of people ought you to be? What sort of people ought we to be, Pastor Johnson? We ought to be the people who God says that we are. Uh, you are blessed, you are salt, you are light, and so in light of who God says you are in Christ, so do likewise. Um, let your righteousness that exceeds that of the scribe of the Pharisees shine and, and season. Um, the righteousness that is not your own, uh, but is the righteousness of another, the righteousness of Christ our Lord. What's righteousness? Big word. Yes. Righteousness is this... Um, more, I mean, it carries with it a number of different connotations, but certainly the, the moral quality of, of the person. Um, I think that's part of it, not all of it, um, mm -hmm. but the, the righteousness. Uh, Jesus lived a perfect life on our behalf, and, and that is, in a sense, credited on our account. The, the Reformers would talk about imputed righteousness, that there is this, this bar that we must attain to that we cannot attain to, uh, but but Christ has done everything for us and fulfilled all the law's demands on our behalf. And so there's this uh, measure that God expects of humanity, and we constantly fall short of that. And so Jesus steps in to, to do what we cannot do for ourselves, but then gives us the um, gives us his spirit that we may uh, do these things as, as best we can. So there is something, and there is a way God wants us to be, mm -hmm. And Jesus is that way, and we are not. That's what I hear you saying. Yep. There's a way God wants us to be. Jesus is that way. We are not that way. And so righteousness is to be everything God wants you to be. And the promise of the church is that the promise given through the church, the promise of the gospel, the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ, is that he makes us everything God wants us to be through the gift of himself. Mm -hmm namely the gift of himself on the cross, dying for our sake. What he does there counts for us, makes us what God wants us to be. So, with that in mind, remembering that the life of Christ is a gift to us, that righteousness, being what God wants us to be, is something God does in us through Jesus, we have been looking at how Jesus tells us to live in Matthew chapter 5. And I believe we're starting at verse, is that 38? Yep. And if you could read Pastor Johnson, verse 38 to the end of the chapter. You bet. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven." For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's talk for a moment about what it means to be the child of someone in Holy Scripture because that really influences our understanding and opens up our understanding of this passage. To be someone's child in Holy Scripture is to be an image of that person. In particular, to be somebody's son in Holy Scripture is to be the image of the Father. And so when... God creates Adam and Eve. He creates them in his image. They, he creates them then as his children. Subsequent sin in the Garden of Eden mars that image. 
It steals from them the status of children. It must be granted back to us in Jesus, as we learn in John chapter 1. Faith in Jesus Christ gives people the right to be called children of God, because Jesus ultimately is the image of the Father. But to be the image of the Father in a very and solely human way means what we have all known to be sort of the traditional path, the, tra the traditional approach or path of fathers and sons in history, which is that the fa if the father is a blacksmith, the son becomes a blacksmith. Mm -hmm. If the father is chivalrous, he raises his son to be chivalrous. Uh, if, a pa if, a, if a father is, is not a good man, uh, often a child and a son will follow the path of that not very good man. And so to be a child is to be an image of that parent. And so we have here in um, verse, not verse 45, but verse 46, yeah, that he says, I say to you, well, in the end of 44 into 45, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. That is the only point in this passage where Jesus says why we are to live this way. Now, my impression is that, and you tell me if you, this is your impression too, Pastor Johnson, mm -hmm. or if you've had this experience, my impression is that when we tend to unpack the way Jesus tells us how to live, our minds immediately start unpacking how this is advantageous to us, right. or how this is advantageous to society. So, when, for example, when... Uh, Jesus says, well, you know, bless those who persecute you or do not resist those who are doing evil to you. We say something like, yes, because if you do that, uh, you may convert that person. Or if you do that, um, you're going to actually feel better yourself. You'll feel more free. Uh, we, we tend to find all the practical benefits to living this way. Mm -hmm. But Jesus does not say to do it for that reason says to do that you may be sons of your father who right. is in heaven. Uh, and so before we get to the practical application, which is where, everyone, like you said, everyone wants to go there right away, right. Um, there's an even more practical application, which gets at our identity fundamentally, that our, our identity is grounded in being sons of the father um, in, through, through Christ. And uh, we, we, that, that just gets at our human nature, right? Our fallen human nature, we... we we receive, all, we receive all these promises from God, all these words from God, and, and this is who you are, this is who you are, this is who you are. Then, you, then we want to say, okay, well, what do I have to do now? What do I got to do next? Let me know what I got. And so we, we just want to, we want to step in as if God, what God says isn't enough. We need to fulfill um, God's word ourselves. We, we can't just let him declare what he wants to say. There's lots of ways that this happens. Uh, you know, when we study Old Testament laws, like the laws, you shouldn't eat pork, right? And you shouldn't eat shellfish, right? Uh, people always want to say, well, see, they did that in the ancient world because those things carried diseases. And so God's actually protecting them from disease by doing that. Mm -hmm. Instead of just what the Bible says, which is, I'm having you do this so that you're different. Yeah. So that, that you're holy. holy. Yeah. 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 That's why God says he's he, and it maybe has added benefits, but those are not the primary purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And God is not opposed. Pigs are not from the devil. Uh, neither is bacon. We, we love bacon. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that you may be holy, that you may be different, that you may, that you may be set apart mm -hmm. um, as you go into a land that I am giving you. That you don't look like the nations around you, as, as he tells Israel over and over and over again. So what animal does bacon come from? Bacon comes if from pigs, pigs don't come from the devil, and bacon also doesn't come from the devil, what animal does bacon come from? Well, bacon comes oh. from pigs, right? And, and pigs are a gift from God, and, and so <laughs> I guess I'm not sure where you're... I thought there was a bacon animal. A bacon I, animal? I don't know. I'm just Maybe in dumb. Minecraft or something. Like <laughs> there you go. Okay, I'm just being dumb. Uh, yeah, so... The bacon fish. The bacon fish. There you go. The bacon fish. I like that. The bacon fish. Anyway, um, so, so to unpack what he says to do here in more specifics, uh, it also helps remember that Jesus is speaking at a time when there is an imperial government that has 
taken over Judea and Galilee. And when people live under an imperial government, uh, often individual rights start being infringed. People can be struck without due process. That means they can be hit without due process. They can be dispossessed. They can have their possessions taken away. They can be pressed into labor and forced to do work uh, for the sake of this imperial government. And so Jesus addresses all those things here. And he says, let, don't just let them do it, but actually give them more than they're asking. If they hit this cheek, turn to them that cheek. If they take your coat, give them your shirt. If they make you go one mile, then you be sure to go two miles. And again, I've, I've heard this interpreted by people to say, well, Jesus is actually just teaching self-defense. Because what Jesus is saying is if they go to strike you, they're going to use their right hand. So turn the other cheek so they can't hit that cheek. Interesting. That's not in the spirit of this passage. No, no. You know, uh, this is, remember Jesus. Uh, Jesus lets himself be given over to the hands of sinners. He lets himself be tortured. He lets himself be killed. And so the spirit of this passage is that of not, not only not resisting in a passive way, but actively giving yourself to the evil one. Actively handing yourself over to your persecutor and to your enemy. Handing, them over to the, handing yourself over to them in your actions and your generosity. Oh, here's my shirt. But then also handing yourself over to them in your affection. Love your enemies. Pray for them. And why do we do this? So that we may be an image of the Father and a son or a daughter of the Father. And then he goes on to say who the Father is, right? Verse 46 um, and the end of 45. He makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. And... I, when I was a kid, I always thought of that as a negative thing, always sending the rain on people. But, of course, it's a positive thing mm -hmm. because you need rain to live. Absolutely. So he gives that to both the evil and the good. Yeah. God is the God of the righteous and the unrighteous, yeah. whether, the other, whether the unrighteous realize that or not. So God gives himself even to his enemies. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he wants you to live this way so that you'll be like him. Yeah. At Paul, you know, Paul talks about this uh, in, in Philippians chapter 2 where he encourages this congregation that is in the midst of, of, of possible division and strife. He says, Have this mind in you that was in Christ Jesus, who did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but, in self, but, in, mm. but instead emptied himself, um, taking the form of a servant, being obedient even to the point of death, death on the cross. Yeah. And so he, there's that emptying of oneself, and that's what sons of the Father do, because that's what the Father does for a world that is in rebellion to him, yet he nevertheless provides, cares, right. loves, sends rain, lets life happen, uh, and nurtures it all the same. And then that helps us understand, that helps us to understand the very last verse here, verse 40, is that 48? <laughs> you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is sometimes interpreted by people as to say, you must be, you must have such moral rectitude, you must be so morally right, that you are just like God in his moral perfection. It's interesting that the way this that the way his perfection is unpacked here is in terms of mercy specifically, in terms of self-giving. And so the the perfection for which Jesus is calling is a perfection in mercy, a perfection in self-giving. Um Personal holiness is also upheld by Christ in very clear and stricter terms than the Old Testament. Right. But it's always terms that lead us towards mercy, not towards sort of a self-righteous or self-satisfied judgmentalism. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you see that all over the place in the early church where they you, people were wrestling with what does this mean? Um, mm -hmm. This new life in Christ, it's just so different from, from what people were experiencing, where people were used as objects of manipulation to means of an end. Um, whereas, like you said, Pastor, that this is uh, the, the perfection of the Christian is grounded 
in, in, in mercy um, in caring for the least of these among us and even our enemies. So, so far we've talked about politics, sex, marriage, oaths. By politics, I mean relationships with others. Jesus has unpacked all those things in the past chapter. We are now ending chapter 5. Next week, we get to talk about money. So Jesus is just uh, crashing into all of our little fences. As well he, he needs to. As well he needs to. <laughs> because why not talk about the things you're always thinking about, right? Absolutely. That's what Jesus says to all of us. Um, so chapter 6, uh, giving to the needy. And then he teaches us how to pray as well. Why should he not talk to us about the things we're always thinking about anyhow? Uh, this really, this is a sort of side comment as we now finish up here. This really testifies, what, he's, what Jesus does here testifies to the importance of the mind in the life of the disciple. Jesus is here shaping our mind and how to think about things mm -hmm. because thought shapes and forms action. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, we can't, uh, we can't check out our brains when it comes to the one true faith. God has given us brains to, to use uh, and to use for his glory and also to receive all that he has to, to instruct us with. And, and absolutely, we, we need that. Um, and, you know, Paul has that wonderful passage in, in Romans chapter 12. Uh, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. mind. And this is what Jesus is doing with the Sermon on the Mount, transforming mm. our minds to think his thoughts and to live his life that he graciously and in mercy gives to us. Yeah, amen. So, uh, go turn on the news. I usually say turn off the news. Today I say go turn on the news. Uh, listen to the person who you dislike the most and be sure to pray for God to bless that person. And that will be a good Sermon on the Mount activity. Amen. That is, that is a wonderful, wonderful cause of action. Would you please pray for us? Absolutely. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all of your words, these words of which cause us to grow and to make us holy. And yes, they may be uncomfortable, but Lord, you are forming us more and more into the image of your Son, that we may indeed be sons and, and daughters of our Heavenly Father of you, O Lord. And so bless us as we go about our tasks, not seeking to be about the business of retaliation or of anger or of resentment or of hostility, but being of the posture of mercy, of giving ourselves away in love, to those who would seek to hate us or those who we even might despise. So bless our words, bless our actions, season what we do and say with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.